Hello, my name is Grace Aaron. I'm with the Social Uplift Foundation. We have a website called socialuplift.org, and today I'm going to interview Beverly Finley Kaneko with Families for Safe Energy and her son, Ryan Kaneko. Hi. Hi, Beverly. Hi, Grace. Okay, so Beverly, um, we have a video of you up on our website talking about your personal experience with Fukushima and why you came to the United States after that disaster. Can you give us a brief update? And also, uh, I'd like to ask Ryan what his uh, viewpoint on it was. We are still in a holding pattern. Ryan and I are living here in the United States, in California, and Ryan's father commutes back and forth and tries to be with us as much as possible. I think I've uh, mentioned on your website before that we lived in the Yokohama area, which is just south of Tokyo in Japan, and it was marginally affected by the nuclear accident in Fukushima, and we have concerns about the food supply, and that continues until now. Uh, when we go back during the summer, we're very careful about the items we choose to eat and feed to Ryan, and uh, we're always ready to evacuate immediately if we have to. And I'll pass the mic to Ryan to give his opinions. Well, coming to California, it's actually, uh, it's changed a lot for me. First of all, the school, um, the different form of education has affected the way I think. And learning about the new, uh, the new fears of atomic energy and uh, other problems in the world, such as a uh, nuclear war, it actually scares me quite a bit. Yet, after hearing it for a while, you get used to it. And it actually helps, it's, it actually helps sometimes in life to know all of that. And as I've learned from the past, that ignorance is a crime. And I believe that nobody in this world should be ignorant about this certain issue because it can someday affect their life and change it completely and even affect as small as small things as education and the way they think. Oh, that's very, very interesting, Ryan. Thank you. So now, can you give us uh, an update on what's happening with Fukushima? Sure, I'm happy to do that. Actually, I started working on March 11th this year, 2014, with Libby Halivi of Nuclear Hot Seat, and we help her produce a program or a segment called Voices from Japan. And on March 11th, we produced the whole entire program for her. We interviewed I don't pro over 10 people, probably 12 to 14 different people top people in the anti-nuclear and the humanitarian movements regarding Fukushima in Japan. And I have to say that every last one of those people said, here we are three years after the disaster and nothing has changed. Nothing has changed, except for the fact that the government keeps trying to brush the issue under the rug and cover up uh, the Olympics are going to Japan now in 2020, and I think they're trying very hard to make themselves look as good as possible by 2020. Unfortunately, the cleanup of the site has not progressed. They are to the point now where there is so much contaminated water collecting at the site that they're now, the only choice they have is to d dump it into the Pacific Ocean. The rivers in Fukushima Prefecture were contaminated at the time of the accident, and that contamination is now flowing toward the Tokyo area, contaminating the Tokyo water supply. So environmentally, things have not gotten better. They're actually only getting worse. Um, as far as the children's health issues, which is really the closest to my heart, uh, our organization really tries to raise awareness about the children in Fukushima. The 
Fukushima Prefectural Medical University has been doing testing of all of the children's thyroids. They've tested about 80 percent. And I would say around 48 percent of those children that have been tested have shown abnormalities of their thyroids. There are somewhere, I'm not exactly sure of the last count, but somewhere around 80 children that have already been diagnosed with thyroid cancer. Now the government and the uh, nuclear village has tried to deny that there's a link with the nuclear accident, but pediatric thyroid cancer is actually something that's very rare. It's usually a one in a million incidence for the smaller children. If you include the teenagers and older children, it becomes about five in one million. So we are talking about 80 people, 80 kids in somewhere around 250,000. So the rate is extremely high, yet the government it keeps saying, well, you know, it's only because we're doing the testing that this has been discovered and, and giving all kinds of excuses. And uh, people, the government is also trying to send people back into contaminated areas. Uh, they, they have done this big decontamination effort, but it has really been shown to be a farce. There's really no way you can clean radiation from the environment. The whole countryside is dotted with plastic bags full of contaminated soil, full of contaminated debris, and there's nowhere to put it. And in some cases, some of the work, because it's been subcontracted so many different levels, the work at the bottom levels becomes very shoddy and contaminated materials are thrown into rivers, they're buried without any protection underground, and there's no accountability back at the top where this work has initially been contracted. So it's really a situation that I don't really see any end in sight. I don't have an optimistic outlook for it at all. Well, I remember Mr. Yamada said that the, what needs to be done is an international effort on the part of uh, all the nuclear powers to uh, work together to clean up Fukushima because it's just beyond the scope of Japan itself. Um, and I'm sure you agree with that. I agree that there should be an international effort, but unfortunately I feel like at this point there's an international effort to downplay the dis situation. And if you listen to uh, Libby Halevi's nuclear hot seat interviews of people like Allison Katz of the independent uh, WHO, the Independent World Health Organization, and Alex Rosen of the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. You can see how the World Health Organization works in conjunction with the International Atomic Energy Association, which is the international marketing or promotional arm for the nuclear industry to try and bury the facts of what has happened in Fukushima and what has happened in Chernobyl so that the situation can be downplayed. The Fukushima Medical University has signed an agreement with the IAEA that their information is shared with them and, and nobody else, so they've got a, a stranglehold on the data that they're collecting and it's very hard to get around that because they have the stamp of approval from the United Nations. So it's very problematic. So it, an international effort, I think it has to be crafted very carefully with the right sorts of organizations. And um, certainly the IAEA might be able to help with some expertise but they're also 
interested in the continuation of the nuclear industry. So, well, that's not not very heartening, but we can try to pressure whatever powers we think might be able to help to get Fukushima cleaned up because it's just not tenable the way it is. Ryan, I think, wanted to add something. On the 25th, August 25th, was it? There was a, a trial for the boat that, uh, for a, US, a boat called the USS Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan that went through the um, oceans near Fukushima. And appar apparently it uh, got contaminated with radiation and many uh, American sailors were uh, affected by the uh, radiation and have uh, sur many severe problems right now. And uh, there was a trial on the 25th last month and um, I'm still not sure what the verdict of that is. And all I know is that the uh, sailors are having a lot of trouble with, uh, with their own health and they're having a lot of they're having a lot of trouble getting the money to take care of themselves and therefore they are trying to uh, sue the Japanese nuclear industry or energy industry, TEPCO, um, and they had a big court case, yet I am still not sure what the verdict is. And another thing I wanted to add is my uh, mother mentioned the radioactive debris that was uh, being piled up across Japan. Um, actually, there's at the sewage plant there, uh, they um, burn up all the sewage into ashes, and um, they used to be able to turn the ashes into concrete or other materials that could be used for uh, uh, used later as a useful material. Uh, yet now, since it has contaminations, contamination from the rain going down the gutters, um, the ashes cannot be used anymore for any uh, particular kind of uh, resource. A reliable resource and therefore um, there are piles and piles of bags and canisters of ashes piling uh, up across um, uh, across a su across many sewage plants um, one that I can mention is near my house in Yokohama Japan and yeah uh, that's pretty much Ronald Reagan uh, apparently uh, Libby Halibi last month did a uh, a segment on the USS Ronald Reagan and uh, I go I advise you to go watch that to find out more information on that thank you so much Ryan I had one other question and that is I've heard about uh, the Japanese government muzzling the press in Japan and whistleblowers about Fukushima can you tell me about that well that's an issue that's very close to my heart this week uh, a journalist, a TV journalist named Mr. Masaki Iwaji. He was the only TV director to work on the Fukushima issue, the humanitarian problems and the corruption involved, and get it on national TV. He was found dead, and there's a lot of speculation that well, he was found dead, and there are rumors that it was suicide, but there is a lot of speculation that it was not, and it is something that I've been thinking about quite a lot this week. In fact, I, I'm going to be interviewed about it later on uh, for Nuclear Hot Seat, either this week or next week. Uh, so... Yes, there are efforts to muzzle the press. There is a lot of activity with independent journalists writing books, writing in more independent magazines, writing in certain weekly magazines. But for the most part, the mainstream media has really not covered the issue. The Asahi Shimbun newspaper, which is like the New York Times, they have really picked up the ball lately and they've been doing a lot of good investigative reporting. And in fact, Mr. Iwaji was part of the television arm of the Asahi company. And his program, which is, was called Hodo Station, it was a nightly news program that's very popular. I would equate it to 60 Minutes. And uh, that program has come under a lot of fire. The main anchor of that program, Mr. Furutachi, 
who's extremely popular. Um, some people love him and some people hate him. But uh, it was also rumored that he was in danger of losing his job for actually allowing these issues to be covered. But uh, many of us are extremely upset to hear about Mr. Iwaji's death. It's, it's very frightening. Well, thank you so much. Is there, before I end this interview, is there anything hopeful that you, <laughs> yeah, I know that you speak to school children all the time, uh, families for nuclear safety. What, what is your hopeful message? Well, I think all we can do is keep trying to educate the children and young people to try and create hope for the future generations. I think in Japan there is hope for people who are knowledgeable about the issue. You, you can go there. I, I wouldn't take Ryan to Japan to spend the whole summer if I didn't know of ways to find safe food to eat. Um, there are groups that, you know, research how much radiation is in food, and so there is a lot of grassroots activity, and I think that's where the hope is, is in the grassroots, and I think that's where we can make the change. Do you miss your life in Japan? My friends in Japan, um, I do miss them, yet they have also uh, kind of had the same experience, and many of them have actually moved on, and some of them are actually in America. Sadly, there aren't in California. Some of them are in Texas, and many of my friends have moved on since the earthquake, and sadly, I cannot take contacts with them, and I do really and truly miss them, yet I am glad that I have made new friends along the way uh, that I have been in America. and. Well, hopefully they'll be as good as my old friends. Thank you so much, Ryan and Beverly. I appreciate it very much.